on it uh, now, but anyway, I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, I want to start off by talking about my brother, which is who I made this surprise package for. Uh, he's on the call with us tonight. Uh, his name is Jer, and he does a lot of things and has a lot of interests, but one of the things he loves are cryptids. So like Black Ness Monster, the Sasquatch, all of these things. Uh, and he lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, so the whole point of this package, uh, I'm just going to let that unfurl for you guys as I go through the contents. So just come with me on this ride, okay? So for reasons that will become clear as we go, I wanted this mystery surprise package to appear as though it had been shipped from England. Um, so first I thought I will just mail it to a friend in England, have them turn around and mail it to my brother. That is super expensive. So it's going to be like $60 one way to ship this package. And also, as you'll see later, uh, my friend would have been required to lie on the customs and declarations form, which he was not willing to do because he's a super stickler. Um, <laughs> so starting from the outside of the package, I had a label from some garment I ordered that was shipped from England a long time ago. I scanned that copied and Photoshop, doctored the label, used their low resolution shitty font to still like match it to hopefully kind of make it look like it had come through Royal Mail. So I think- this domestic one? Uh, so because I- <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this isn't recording, right? <laughs> uh, because I had faked a label, this meant I could no longer actually ship it, which uh, was a delay for me, right? So I had made this now completely unshippable <laughs> package. And I think this isn't necessarily even the right type of royal mail for a package this heavy. I guess I was hoping my brother was not that expert in royal mail. You know, I was hoping I could get away with a little fudging here. But okay, moving deeper into the package. Um, this is what it looks like when you take off the craft paper. There's just a reuse box inside. Inside of that is a letter that I I'm doctored up from a law firm. Let's see, how do I get to the... Here. Probably probably here we are. Okay, so I made up this fake law firm. I tried to pick a convincing address in London because my brother actually really knows London really well. So picked in like a cosmopolitan neighborhood of London. And the gist of it is, it says, Dear Jeremy Baldwin, through a series of exchanges, this parcel came into the care of our law firm. This bag was found in the woods of the Forest of Dean, southeast of Park End, by a hiker along with the animal bones, which we found next to the bag. We have determined that the parcel is of essentially no financial value, but it may be of familial interest. Using Ancestry.com, we found that you are the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son of the alternate contact listed in the included journal inside cover. So here's the setup. Just how people talk. Okay, so I made up this whole story. Uh, so this branch of our family, the Baldwin family, is from England, from an area called the Forest of Dean, and it was my brother and I's great grandfather who moved to the United Great Grand, who moved to the United States. Before that, they were all in the Forest of Dean. And there's a lot more to this family tree, but we did have a great grand uncle who had died as a child. Uh, I have no idea what he died. As you can imagine, that would have been fairly common for children to die. Did you say the forest would be, is that like a neighborhood or did they live in the forest? Uh, it, no, it's a, it's a region with okay. multiple towns in it, yeah. I think it was at one time forested, it's mostly farmland now, but with some patches of forest still, that's going to come up later. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but there is this mystery of how did this, you know, ancestor from our family tree die. 
of course I fudge things a little bit in order to make it go with this story I wanted to tell I kind of fudged the dates of his birth and death a little bit again hoping that my brother did not really have our family tree perfectly memorized <laughs> um okay how does this relate to cryptids? So, you know, lots of different areas have their own cryptid, like we have the Hodag in Northern Wisconsin. Um, the Forest of Dean has the Beast of Dean. So uh, this creature has been being seen since 1802. It's basically an enormous boar, the size of an elk, and they call it the moose pig or the beast. Um, it it can, die. What's that? It doesn't die. I mean, it's just like the Loch Ness Monster, right? It's one of those things where every decade or so, some teenagers have a sighting of it, and the stories go on and on, right? I mean, you, right. I mean, spoiler alert, they're not real. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay, moving deeper into our package. So the main component of this package is this bag that I made, and I kind of made it as like a bag of all personal essentials that um, Frederick Baldwin would have had with him. So I machine sewed uh, this bag out of green canvas, and then I brought it to Sector, at the time it was Old Sector, and sandblasted it, that was Chris's idea, which was super effective at like wearing the fabric to make it look much older. I then made a little soup of instant coffee and mud that I let sit for weeks till it got moldy, and then I let this bag sit in there for a long time, hoping that the mold and the mud would cancel out the smell of coffee. I think you could still smell coffee a little bit. I don't know, we should ask my brother. But um, I didn't want it to smell nice like a Starbucks, you know? Uh, but the coffee was really good for dyeing and making it look older. Okay. So then we've got items in this pouch. Um, I was having a hard time sourcing an old button to close the pouch. So I just decided, oh, somewhere along the line, the button fell off. So I just sewed on some loose thread. <laughs> um, so we've got the journal of Frederick Baldwin. And then we've got this newspaper clipping that he clipped out about himself. Um, so getting to this newspaper clipping. Uh, so it says, uh, Park End, Frederick Baldwin, age 18 of Park End, is set off on a personal Expedition to prove the existence of the mysterious moose pig monster. Sightings of the moose pig or the beast of Dean have been reported for over a century, but no hard evidence of its existence has ever been found. Baldwin plans to change that by finding a live moose pig. The beast is described as a wild boar the size of elk. Um, and I found like some old Victoria era articles to put on the back, you know, to make it look like a newsprinted article. For the photo, <laughs> believe it or not, this photo is like from 1990, I swear. My family, I, we did this all the time. All of our family photos, we would go to one of those old time photo <laughs> So I, the problem with that photo is it actually is too old for my story, right? So, uh, but I took my brother's face and put it on, the, oh, let's see it for us here. This is kind of blocking. You can here. hit the upper left the little window. Open this one? Yep. There we go. Um, so I found some random period appropriate photo on the internet where the guy looked like he was in camping attire and I put my brother's face on it because I thought it'd be funny if this great grand uncle just happens to highly resemble my brother. It's possible. It's possible. Um, and that was the photo I printed at the top of the, that newsprint clipping. And for the, I just, you can buy newsprint paper for your printer. So I just printed it out on there and once again did my mud and coffee and crinkling it. And I, I think it seemed it seemed fairly re realistic like old newspaper. So that's good. Um, so a big component of this was the journal, and uh, so it says on the front it's a, uh, a search to encounter the beast of Dean, and on the front inside page it says, "If found, please return to Frederick Baldwin or my eldest brother Albert Baldwin, who's our actual uh, great grandpa." So that was my. My way that would make the lawyer contact our branch of the family. So I got my husband to handwrite this using an actual pen that you dip in ink to write all of this because I thought his handwriting would be less recognizable. So it tells the whole story of the background on the moose pig and then a day by day journal of like, I found the scat of the moose pig. I found the tracks. I'm getting closer. Oh, it's right over there. I'm going to go find it right now. 
So he started working with us with a dip pen <laughs> in the moment. I have in yeah, the woods. Yeah. It didn't yeah. really say ah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't have Twitter, but yeah. <laughs> um, so and that was again soaked in my coffee and mud mixture. But in order to make this be his like a pouch of essentials that he was carrying when camping, I thought we needed some other like personal items in there. So I sourced an uh, antique pocket knife. This was one of the harder things to find because it turns out antique pocket knives are really desirable and people want to charge you a lot of money for them. And they also often have a maker stamp from some city in America, which didn't make sense for my story. So I had to kind of search around for that pocket knife. That's a match safe. So that's something you would have stored your matches in to keep them dry. This is a modern uh, chapstick tin that I stripped off the paint. Uh, to, you know, I thought like, you'd bring ointment camping on you. So I stripped off the paint with acetone and put like some goofy stuff in there. Um, yeah, thank you, eBay. So I thought, well, he had a little money with him. So I made this little coin pouch, but then for each one of these coins, I had to find an eBay sale of British coins from pre-1912, which I did. Uh, <laughs> Can't figure if you're doing this because I've been loving brothers so much. It's a fine line. It's a fine line. Does this story end with him getting lost in the woods or what? <laughs> like I have my pennies and all my British coins. Uh, but then there's more to this story. <laughs> So there is presumably included by the lawyer, this little Ziploc that says found alongside the bag. Inside the Ziploc are these animal bones. But it's hopefully you're noticing there is only one animal with bone shaped like this. So these are human finger bones um, that I had to age to look old. Um, and let's see, I've got a little video. Oh, there we right. ask where you got these human finger bones. <laughs> She's like, I got the only one. <laughs> So they came looking brand new, of course. Uh, this I tried a few different experiments to age them. In the end, I think. Um, Where did you get them from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amazon. Yeah. Amazon sells human bones, and you can. They, I checked. There's nothing's changed since 2017. You can today still go on to Amazon, and you can buy yourself your own set of phalanges. And they're really inexpensive. <laughs> they're just limited to handbags? No, they're just, the yeah. Yeah, they're just the cheapest. Yeah, they're just the cheapest. What's the stall cost? Well, I don't know. You should find out. Stalls are like seven hundred. That's probably the most desirable. <laughs> yeah. Um, after after Kate asked me for advice about this, uh, <laughs> I went and looked around to see what was out there. <laughs> uh, so if you look at that pouch that I sewed, um, I have this. I used some yellow paint to make this hand So the idea is that, you know, these hand bones were found near the pouch, you know, uh, from the clutching of the pouch. Um, so what I used to age them, that I think in the end, I tried a few things first that worked well, was wetted instant coffee crystals kind of rubbed into the bone. The only problem with that is it left a little bit of a shine, but uh, some corn flour fixed that up right away. I think it worked pretty well. Pretty hard to dampen the smell of like wafting coffee. I think there might have, we should have asked my brother here, but I, I think that I probably it did smell a lot like in, coffee. Yeah. In hindsight, we could have ozoned it and that would have eaten up all the organics. Uh, you just bury everything for like a couple of weeks. For like a hundred years. <laughs> so the other important thing to include was the tusk of the moose pig. Um, so I sculpted this tusk in the include in there. So this was fairly big and heavy. This is why shipping the package would have been so uh, expensive. Um, so here is how I made the, this very important component, the actual tusk of our mythical animal. So my friend Becca was a huge help with this part of it. She said, I think you should look into paper clay. Uh, and she sent me a YouTube video that was super helpful. So I kind of put the recipe here, it's weird ingredients, but it comes together into a pretty easy to work with um, clay that then just dries on its own and hardens. And then the other piece of advice that Becca gave me that was uh, really helpful was coating this in a very thin layer of wax. So I used a heat gun and I just used candle wax because that was what I had. And with the heat gun, you could get it so thin 
that I don't think you would know it was coated in wax. It just gave it this kind of organic feel when you touch the horn. It really made a huge difference in making it feel a lot more like maybe it really had come from an animal. Um, so that, that wax was brilliant. So putting the story together here. 1912, young Frederick Baldwin goes on an extended solo camping trip to find the beast of Dean. After weeks of tracking, he finds the beast. The moose pig kills him. Presumably, I guess, maybe eats his whole body, except for his hand. Somehow his hand is left, clutching his bag of personal belongings. Uh, the beast loses a horn in the struggle somehow, which is also left by the bag. And in 2017, it's found, it's given to a law firm. The identifying information included in the journal results in it being sent to the great grand nephew of the author of the journal, which is my brother here. So this was the whole story. But I was still left with how to get the package to my brother. So it sat in my closet for months, all the way till 2018. Maybe the coffee walked it off just in my closet. I don't know. But uh, I was visiting, I went to visit my brother in Michigan, just normal. And while I was there, I had a secret conversation with his friend, Kurt. I gave him the package and he held it for like a week so it wouldn't be suspicious and then deposited it on my brother's porch. Um, however, despite all of this like brilliance, somehow <laughs> my sister-in-law, who is way too smart, apparently she immediately knew that both Kurt and I were involved. Package. I can't imagine how. I can't imagine how. Sounds and, like uh, you've been doing this to your family for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think they all put it together pretty quickly, but I hope that they enjoyed it. Um, so that is that I can stop sharing now. Yeah, so uh, that's the story of the moose thing, and this is the story of my brother. Uh, it's on here too if we have questions. I didn't buy it for a minute. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. <laughs> Since I know Catherine like you do, it was obvious. <laughs> but amazing. I hope you re ebayed all the coins and the, you know, everything else just to get. Oh, yeah, I've made good money. <laughs> <laughs> that horn fetched a fine price, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Is flag for selling human bones on eBay? <laughs> eBay doesn't allow human remains sold anymore. They, for a little while, they were illegal on there, and they're not anymore. <laughs> this is not the first project that someone has come in with. The last project was a human skull, at which point I got my friend who wanted to use the human skull to buy a, a fake human skull that looks really real to use instead of a real skull, because she has the whole skeleton. And I said, we're not getting haunted by the skeleton missing the skull because some asshole steals the skull. So it was going to go into an art installation that was outside. Uh, and so we didn't want somebody to steal the thing, not realizing like it's an actual legit a skull. A legit skull in the box. But yes, Kate has been the first one to buy new bones to make them look old. Yeah. Other questions, by the way? Anybody else torment their family? So, what, I mean, what was the. Impetus to, to try to prank your brother? You know, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's a good question. Um, I think I had heard about this, this like concept of sending this mystery package, you know, that like would have some story that unfolds as you like, you know, examine all the parts. Um, yeah, and my brother's a cool, pretty cool person. And I thought, you know, he'd enjoy something like this. <laughs> Although I'm not sure I'm right about that. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Hey, yeah, I'm going to give it to you. Like when I broke my elbow and they gave me. Yeah, 
Oh, I don't know if I want to click links or Bob. I mean, what's I can look it up later. Could be. Oh, okay. Hey, look at this. You could just buy a thing. Yeah, you could just outsource the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the case. Way. It couldn't possibly just cost more than me putting all of that together. No, it's not <laughs> way more. How long did you spend doing that? That's like three decades of present giving effort. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. See, now you gotta pour a spending shit and set it up so like you receive a package like 10 years after you die. Oh, I really should do that. That would be yeah. <laughs> and then he's talking about it. Well, he'll know what he eats. So he's got a screen share that he's going to like from the computer here. Or can everybody hear me? Anything that uh, has it set up so that like uh, uh, well, thank you for that. Um, this is a completely different beast. I will try and keep it as short as possible. Uh, this is uh, much more of a data presentation than anything else. So there's no servos or switches or anything. I apologize for that as well. Um, basically, what I want to show is a product that we're working on. Uh, me and my team work down in the corner down there. And um, one of the products we're working on right now is called SQL on Air. And um, what I'm hoping to show is two products, SQL Server and Airtable. And first we'll look at why Airtable is superior in a variety of ways, why it's better. And then how SQL on Air can actually take some of that benefit and inject it back into SQL Server and basically, hopefully, arguably make SQL Server better. For anyone who doesn't know the background of this, it's basically you think Excel, all the programmers are screaming. Right? It's basically Excel spreadsheets, but yep. way more sophisticated. And then trying to make them easy again, I think. Yep. All right, there we go. That's, yeah, so databases, I'll take I'll take just a sec and give a little bit of background for uh, for anyone who isn't a programmer or doesn't deal with databases or data science. Uh, yeah, as as Chris said, um, a database is basically like a spreadsheet except you can split the data up into multiple places and then link it back together asking very, very complex questions. You can have a list of people. And actually that's what's here. So there's a list of customers and each customer we're keeping track of their name and phone number and email address and the tax rate that they pay. And then we've got some products and there's just the name and price of each product. And then this keeps track of a shopping cart. So this would be like on a website, somebody adds an item to their cart that would create a cart for them which has a cart number and the date they create it and a link to the customer that the cart belongs to. And then each cart can have multiple items in the cart. And so a cart item links a shopping cart to a specific product, uh, which is where the price comes from, and a specific quantity. So you can have three of something in your shopping cart. Um, so this is called a normalized data model. And the idea is that each piece of data just talks about one particular part of it. And you have to kind of link it all back together again to ask questions of it, but it's a very efficient way to store data. You're not storing the same information again and again and again. And so this is what the data actually looks like in the database. I know this is pretty small, um, but basically this first table here is a list of products. I have product A and product B with a price. And then there are a couple of customers. I've got Bob and EJ and Mary. And then there's three shopping carts and it has the date and the customer. And then down at the bottom, sorry, I have a pop up. Uh, down at the bottom, I have a list of the items in the cart, and it lists a cart to a product at a particular quantity. But what you can see from this, even though it's hard to see the specific data, it's it's hard to read, both visually here, but also um, if I want to know like who ordered what and how many and how much it cost, I, I don't get it from this. I have to write. A pretty complex set of code in SQL. You may prefer the term SQL. This is SQL. And it basically says select data from customers and the cart and the product table and join it all together. And it explains how to multiply the quantity times the unit price to get a total. And it produces a nice little grid with a list of our shopping carts. I have three shopping carts one for EJ, one for Bob, one for Mary. It has my phone number and email address and the total amount of. Uh, 
the quantity. Can you guys read that? Is it too small? Okay, I can see it. I don't know if this matters. So after writing like 10 lines of SQL, I can then say where total is less than 20. And that will select the two shopping carts whose total value is less than 20. Like so. It's a lot of words. Really, what I want to say is show me the shopping carts where the total is less than 20, which is what this one line of code says. Select from shopping cart where subtotal is less than 20. But if I run that, it gives me an error because the table doesn't, the shopping cart table doesn't have the total. To figure out the total in a shopping cart, you have to look up its items and link all those items to their associated product and take the price from the product and multiply it by the quantity and sum all that. And that gives you the, the subtotal. Then you can ask, show me all those where that's going to be 20. So this is SQL Server. It works. It's how a vast majority of the databases on the planet work. Even if it's not SQL, if it's another one, it's going to follow the same kind of system. And I'm now going to show Airtable, same data, same information, same kind of questions, but just a totally different user experience. So this is the order table the shopping cart table rather, in Airtable. And I can just see the card number and the customer's name and phone number and email address and the tax rate that they pay. EJ is currently set to pay 55%, which is a lot. So on a $68 order, uh, I'm paying $37.90 for over $100 total. But in Airtable, these are calculated fields. So this tax rate is a lookup to my customer record. I can go over to my customer record here and change this to what it should be, which is 5.5%. And you'll notice now my total, that my customer total, which is automatically went down from 100 down to 72. And if I go back to this list of shopping carts, my EJ order is now 5.5%. So my tax is now only $3. And so my total order went from $100 down to 72. And right here, I can filter where total is less than, right now it's set to less than 1,000. If I change it to say where it's less than 100, now I'm giving you a few rows. There's no joining, there's no like lines and lines of complex code. I can just say, show me the shopping cart to make the total less. So then what our product does is takes a normalized database like you would have in SQL Server, looks at what we did in Airtable, and basically injects all of that behavior into SQL Server as a single operation. So to start with, I've split it into two for explanation purposes. I'm gonna start by adding some extra data into the tables so that we can still see the two products here and the three customers and the shopping carts and the line items in those carts, but there's extra fields for all the stuff we wanna know about those things. So the shopping cart table has a field for the subtotal and the customer name and phone number and email address and then tax rate and so on. So now we just have to get the right values in there and keep them. And so that's what SQL on air does. Using a series of stored procedures and views and SQL sort of things, it makes SQL Server better. So that now I can ask that question I wanted to be able to ask, which is this. Select star from shopping cart where subtotal is less than 20. Now we just get those two shopping carts with the customer name and email address and phone number. And oh, it's behind here. Sorry, so it's watching. And then the tax rate and tax. And so my taxable uh, total at the moment is six dollars and thirty cents. Um, and I can select that from all of these tables. So if I just reselect this we'll see that all the data has been filled in. So all the fields off on the right here for the customer, the, the, for the product, the total amount of orders and the total currently in shopping carts, for the users, their total customer sales, um, for the shopping carts, the subtotals and lookups and so on. But then we can also modify the data. So the data behaves just like your regular normalized database. And so if I look at my Data, for example, this is my user row, and my name is EJ. My phone number is one two three four five six seven eight nine zero. My tax rate is back down at 0.05%, so my 
total is 630. Here's my shopping cart, I'm paying 30 cents in tax. But if I update customer and I set name equals EJ Alexander, my full name, and provide my full phone number and change my tax rate up to 50% again, what's gonna happen? This is the value before having updated it. And so it's still my old information and the old value, but now in the new value, my main name is now EJ Alexander. My phone number has been updated. My tax rate's now 50%. And so my customer total went from 630 up to $9 because my $6 order down here, my $6 order, I'm paying $3 in tax. So I'm paying 50% so the database just continues to maintain those calculations based on what I designed over an Airtable, all with no code. I could change the price of product A from $2, where the four items in the cart are worth $8. Once we change that unit price to $1,000, now those same four items are worth $4,000. And that change will have cascaded through the whole data model. So now the customer, the product, Product A, the unit price is 1,000, so the total value in there is 4,000. Uh, EJ and Bob both have one of those product A's in their cart, so their cart total is now in the 1,000 instead of just the tens of dollars. Uh, the line items are all updated, so the three items that EJ has in his cart are worth 3,000. They're calculated to be worth 3,000. And then for the order itself on that 3,000, because I'm still paying 50% tax, that's 1,500 in tax. So it basically took that normalized database where we have to write complex code, code to ask it questions and then run that code every time we want to ask the question and instead flattens it out and adds all that data as just calculated fields that can easily just be queried or sorted or grouped by and that then can be maintained as Questions. So, who, who makes Airtable? Airtable is a company that started in, I think, 2015. And Airtable is basically like if a spreadsheet and a database had a baby in the cloud, <laughs> that's Airtable. So, it feels like a spreadsheet, it acts like a spreadsheet, it looks like a spreadsheet, but it's actually a database. So, does your, does your code actually use Airtable or is it just inspired by the concept? That is a really, really good question. So the short answer is that the flagship product for my company is called Effortless API for Airtable, where I use Airtable. I suggest people use Airtable. I can build software and APIs and stuff to talk to Airtable. This variation of the product is purely inspired by Airtable, where I'm only using Airtable to, so we had a SQL database. I basically created a digital twin of it in Airtable with all the same data. And then use their table to add all these cool features, lookups and rollups and calculations and things that Airtable can do. And then what our tools do is take just the description of what needs to happen, basically the documentation. If I go to the help here in Airtable, Airtable explains what we have set up. And if I go to the shopping cart table, we can scroll down and see that the tax is a lookup, that the tax uh, rate is a lookup to the customer table, and that the tax is calculated as the sum so total times the cash. So I'm actually literally taking this documentation and through a series of transforms and tools producing a SQL script that adds a bunch of stuff into the SQL server that causes it to do this. And so then if we go back into Airtable and make changes, we add more columns, we can change the calculations. We can describe a lot of business logic about the system we're developing in Airtable in that way. And then we just rerun the tool and it will recreate that SQL script and run that SQL script again and just update the SQL database to follow the new rules. So your product will always be hand in hand with Airtable. That's right. So ironically, the first person I actually pitched this to was my brother. And the first thing he said is, I don't want to use Airtable. <laughs> so what we're going to end up doing for him is getting rid of Airtable, and all we actually pull out of it are the, the specific details about this is a lookup column, this is a rollup, this should sum these values, this should multiply this times this and put the value over here. It's just those like calculations. 
And so we should be able to just build him a tool where he can just specify that map and it will just modify his existing database directly while giving him this extra, this extra function. What's like an example of a business end use? Scraping shopping websites to get information about the targets or ads to people who spend less than $20 or so the the target for effortless API for Airtable would be anybody who's using Airtable. The target for SQL on Air is literally anybody who's using SQL Server. So anybody who has a product that's based on SQL Server, they're using SQL Server, they're using the relational nature of SQL Server, but they're having to write SQL to like constantly rearrange and recombine and and, and uh, Sort of manage that data. It's amazingly powerful and can deal with hundreds of millions of rows, which are people can't, but it's um, it's complicated. The genius of Airtable is that they figured out if you take those complex systems and you break them down to just individual little bite sized things, it's really, really easy. So in Airtable, you can add a lookup to another table, and then once that value has been pulled in from another place, now you can roll it up into a field over here or combine it, but you can't. You can't create one big statement. Everything is just a series of little, like take this and multiply it by here and put it here. And then take this and put it over here. It's, it's just little bite-sized things that let you design these fairly enormously complex systems. Like that little air table where I added, there were maybe 20 fields in the original database and I added maybe 10 more calculated fields. But you end up with a system. So this is the data model. So this is a part item. Every one of these fields that has a star next to it has related cascading function that has to be implemented. So for example, if you change the quantity of the of a particular product in a shopping cart, just quantity, that quantity means that you then have to update the subtotal for that cart item. Anytime you update the subtotal for the cart item, you then have to update the subtotal for the whole cart. When you update the subtotal for the whole, whole cart, you have to recalculate the tax, which then you have to recalculate the total just for that part, then the customer has a roll up of all of their orders, all of their parts. And so that then has to be rolled up and update the customer total. And the product has a total units in shopping cart. And if we change the quantity of that product in somebody's cart, the total units in shopping cart for the product. So these rules are what actually have to be done. And their table let us specify those rules by just right clicking adding a column that's a little bit, right click adding a column. One, one of the time we just added those, and the end result of that is this fairly detailed map where every one of these fields has a has a cascade like that of effects that happen when that value changes. And so every time you either insert or update data in that SQL server, it has to kick off certain procedures that go do all of this. So that's the automation. Some of this could be done with pivot tables, and some of this could be done with macros, like you could potentially take an Excel spreadsheet that had the same behavior. And be able to go to the product tab of that spreadsheet and change the price of a product, and then flip back over to the to the order tab and have it have updated the result based on the new product price. But we need macros to do it. Um, simple things, a simple sum or pivot or something like that, could potentially be done with just the tools that are already there. The biggest thing that's hard to do, which this does, is the logic can zigzag. So the tax rate goes from the customer record to the order. And then the orders all get summed and go back to the customer record. So it creates a, a circular reference basically between the two things, which is difficult to do um, with just simple views and, uh, or, or just simple spreadsheets. So it's the things that it's the more complicated business logic, which is where it really shines, which is why CD server perfect, but totally also part of the way so. And we follow the same map. Like if we wanted to have an Excel spreadsheet do these same things. It, this English description of what it's going to do is the thing we want to be able to verify, and then we can do it with actually a penny one. You could have a SQL server version of it, my SQL version. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Any other questions? Well, right. thanks so much. Thanks uh, I know it's pretty abstract. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it as my backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, do you want to take pictures or is this a website? Oh, I can email them. Oh, you can email them. Oh, I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you mean directly or? Thanks. Uh, my name is Nick Hine. I'm interested in a lot of things, but uh, most people know me for uh, weird bikes and uh, it's got another two. And uh, uh, no, I'm just trusting the bodies. Uh, I didn't build these. I, uh, um, but the background of the story is a uh, bike riding friend of mine, uh, uh, for attendant is like, and had to have bike surgery and won't be able to bike again for about six months, possibly. And uh, uh, that was going to be uh, inhuman, inhumane that torture to him. So he called me up and said, uh, "You know where I can get an arm power? That arm train, right? Well, I've got an arm, arm uh, bike in my basement that I can take into a train." And uh, he said, "Well, that, that'd be great." And, uh, but I'll look at Craigslist anyway. And uh, uh, so I got the bike out, uh, the one that I showed last month, and. Uh, Started riding it and uh, I, was, I was having a lot of fun with it. I really enjoyed it. Pretty fast bike. I could ride on some roads safely, even with just the lever power in my arms. Uh, so I thought, uh, yeah, screw him. <laughs> we'll get him another bike up, uh, another arm bike up, Craigslist. And uh, I'll have this one to go riding it. And uh, so this is what we found. A guy in South Carolina had this uh, intrepid tour for sale. Uh, it, the chain drives the front wheel the steering. There's a head tube um, between your knees. It's like 45 degree angle. You steer by putting the whole front wheel and chain assembly over to one side or the other. And uh, it has a really wide turning range. So I was barely able to turn it around in the width of the street. From my house. But um, uh, we brought it. Uh, I was on honeymoon the last two weeks. Um, my wife and I uh, did a bike ride from uh, Pittsburgh to DC. And then uh, afterwards, we went to West Virginia to visit my kids. And so, after visiting my daughter in southern West Virginia, we were only two hours, four hours away from this guy. And he agreed to drive two hours to meet us. So, we took it up and stuff it in the back of my wife's kind of fit with our tandem bike, our bike trailer, all of our uh, luggage for two weeks. And this on top of we still had uh, room for stuff. Uh, it's two cool cars, like one of those palm cars, where you know, keep getting out of it. Keep getting, keep getting out of it. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so I uh, I rode this bike into work today, two miles, and I rode six miles over my friend's house to deliver it to them. To try it out. And, uh, uh, and it looks like uh, he's going he's to take the really, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, so grateful to me for driving uh, it for two hours, pick it up, and then step in the car and go home. Um, what was that picture taken? That was in front of my house. I'm making it over here. In front of Oldbrook Park. So, uh, the thing uh, that I could use ideas for is we're trying to figure out a way to make a carrier for this pressure. That's what my back is going to be able to come from. So, say, yes, uh, it doesn't really matter. Seen something available. Um, then uh, on the way home, I uh, while we were gone, I found another automobile for sale. Of, uh, uh, I don't have a picture. Well, this is what a automobile is. Uh, 
right side of the screen is probably good too. For the oh. little arrows. Okay. okay, this is what a Bellmobile looks like. This is the Bellmobile that I bought. This is not what it looks like. This is what it looked like before the guy I bought it from got it. And uh, I'd be a little nervous to show you a picture of what this now. On the way home, we stopped. I test drove this. I decided to buy it from the next weekend. This will be a major uh, bigger project to uh, refinish the carbon glass in that. He had uh, he covered all that beautiful paint with uh, plastic, yeah, with the stuff you dip your cool handles in. And uh, Hi. Helps, helps it there in uh, He's a liberal arts scientist. Yeah, I, I don't know why he did that. But uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to that. This is different. For, uh, this is a different brick mate of Bellmobile than the one that I got. It's a little race here. It's got lower ground clearance. There's a wider turning circle. It's a little tired to get in and out of. But uh, uh, in spite of that, I think I might be using this one for my kids because it looks very well. And uh, I can't make it look much worse. Um, and, and it's actually a once once I undo all the stuff to get about all the work that will have to come tonight. The uh, one other thing for everyone. I, I talked about a trailer that I built for uh, this honeymoon trip that we took. And, uh, that worked really well. However, I didn't do anything to treat the aluminum on the uh, uh, channel that makes up the frame. And it, uh, it really marked up the uh, nice or lead uh, waterproof duffel bag. It's got aluminum oxide all over it. So I have to uh, take the trailer apart and uh, find somebody to put it. Got that. And, uh, Last thing, I work at Dream Bikes. We, uh, we uh, take donated bikes, fix them up, and we sell them or donate them to people in need. Uh, right now, uh, there are a lot of uh, Africans being resettled in this country who need bikes. And uh, I've, uh, I've been put in charge of um, fixing bikes up for them. And uh, I would welcome any volunteers uh, who want to come help. Uh, it doesn't require bike mechanic skills. We've got a lot of things to do besides wrenching. And, uh, Skills. So contact me if you're interested in helping out with that. We're going to be doing probably about 10 or 12 bikes. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yeah. How many bikes do you have on there? How many wheels do you have on, on bicycles? Maybe that's a better, like, you know, uh, three. Yeah. Three, so. Well, uh, as of uh, this weekend, I'll have two automobiles, a tandem, two front wheel drive bikes, one that's on the uh, transmission bike that I can up the type on. I really don't have a count. <laughs> I was just curious because, yeah, the count, the count is gaining, so. <laughs> it's less than 10. <laughs> uh, um, and I'll admit it's an irrational number. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah, I saw. Cool. I was just curious. I yeah. don't want to go up to your question. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dave. Great. Uh, so I've got a, a presentation I'll do from the this remote camera here so that might behave. In fact, I think that we all need. Um, so we were given a, uh, not given, we are loaned a 500 watt fiber laser, fiber optic laser. It's down in the crate down there. It was bought three years ago. Uh, never opened, never done anything with it. It's been sitting. And then uh, they found the head for it and the Galvo head as well for it. Um, so this is the output, like the business end of the laser. So the laser is uh, a box about a big, and then it just has a fiber optic cable that comes out of it. So it just looks like a little pencil sized cable and a little pencil sized cable carries 500 watts of light at about 1064 nanometers, um, which is invisible to us, so we can't see it at all. And then that fiber optic flux in the back here uh, goes down through a column A optic into a focusing optic, which is adjustable. So there's a little adjustment window in here. So you manually adjust the focus up and down. And then it comes out the, the business end here. There's a protective window down here in, in the mirror to guard any spatter or anything coming back up and damage the lens. And then there's a, like a 100 PSI air connection that goes here to uh, clean out the channel that's being created by the laser. Uh, so 
This will get bolted on the plasma cutter for now. We're going to try it on that platform, both to test the plasma cutter and because it's a reasonably suitable platform to run this on. Um, fun things I've learned about YAG lasers is I'm looking at it. They have two different types of head. This is a manual focus head. They also have an auto focus head. And the manual focus heads are like seven to nine hundred dollars. And then the auto focus heads are like two to three to five thousand dollars. And the documentation is fairly poor because most of the time people are buying full machines, they aren't buying pieces. So there's not a lot of information out there about them. So I was trying to figure out what's the difference between an auto focus head and manual focus head. Why would you buy one or the other? In our case, the laser is only 500 watts, which is a lot, but industry is not very much. So it can only cut about six millimeters, quarter inch of steel. Um, which means that you don't have a lot of like 3D surface effect to it because the material is not very deep. So it turns out if you want to cut a really small channel out of a piece of metal, um, this thing amazed me when I bought it on Amazon. It's a gauging chart for a sheet metal. And it just, it's not the crazy, it's just a piece of steel with a bunch of little gaps in it. But what amazed me was the 7,000 gap through a piece of eighth inch plate, which breaks a lot of rules on a light process being really able to make a really small hole and a thick thing. So I wanted to understand how do they manage to do 7,000s through a thick plate. And it turns out that's what the autofocus does. So if you have an all this passing around, this is just something that's been laser cut. It's used to check the shimmel gauge, so it's an easy way to figure out what thickness of metal you've got. So the autofocus has a camera integrated into the head assembly, and the camera watches the spot size through a mirror. And it watches to see how big the light reflected back up into the system, how big the spot is. And then it uses, I believe it's on piezo, but it's not well documented. And of course, we're not going to buy one and take it apart. But I think it's a, and the lens is on piezo element, so it's extremely fast to respond. And so they can tune the laser as it's moving through the metal to essentially like jigsaw through the material. So they're walking the focus, the focal length up and down through the material to allow the spot to stay super tiny as you're cutting through effectively a 3D surface. Because the problem like the CO2 laser is a fixed mobile plane. So you can only cut such thick things before the beam runs out of juice in the middle because the focus goes in and out of focus. So if you had this autofocus head, you can jigsaw, like seesaw your focal plane through the material. And therefore you can cut things that break this rule of like optical spot size versus thickness of material by essentially starting your spot at the top. And as you go down, walking your focus down with it, and then the instant it jumps back up again and do that really, really, really crazy fast. So I could be wrong, but I believe that's what the autofocus head they're doing. Again, there's not a lot of information aside from people trying to keep the information close because they don't want to like, an, an autofocus head in the US was like $30,000. It's only relatively recent you can buy Chinese versions of it for you know three grand uh, with the controller and whatnot. But this is manual. This is manual focus, so we don't get any of that fun stuff. Now the deal is our laser doesn't have enough power that it matters because six millimeters of material, we could make small spots, but it's not it's not like you're really dropping through one inch thick material. And that's really the only way to cut one inch thick material with the laser is you need to walk the focus through the material as you're cutting. On the side of here though, there's a little gold connection. This little gold connection is a capacitive standoff. So it, it uh, monitors a capacitive charge in the nose of this, just like the saw stop or your cell phone screen works. And then it uses that to find the distance to the work material. In this case, it's always metal. So you could do that. Um, like the CO2 lasers, wood, plastic, all kinds of stuff that don't have capacitive charge. So there's no good way to do auto focus there. Uh, so anyway, this got another connection here. Uh, same kind of problem. They have capacitive amplifiers that so turn this capacitive signal into a linear voltage. But the issue is um, they are documented. And I cannot find anybody online who's documented this type controller. So I can buy a little amplifier, it's $100, but I can't figure out what the pinout is on it because you can buy the $2,000 laser controller and then it's got the, it just plugs in a cable. So I tried looking around online to see if I could find somebody who's got a type controller and is willing to pull a multi and check it, but I haven't found anybody yet. So, so in short, um, I think we're going to have to build a little circuit to do capacitive standoff for this thing, which isn't crazy hard to do, but it's just more work. So long story short, this is one head. The other head is this thing here. Um, this one is uh, called a galvo head. What's inside of here are two motors and a little mirror. And let's see here. Is ready? Uh, this is not, so that's a good point. Actually. This is not the, the real laser. Um, 
This is just a laser pointer. Uh, oh, so nothing. Nothing special going on there. Um, And if we may not kill off our green lasers, so I don't have any cool down for that. But we can still move some mirrors around. And see that. Um, so what's inside of here is um, two mirrors, basically two big motors. And then I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's pivoting the mirror back and forth. So it's just wondering. And I had taken a laser pointer. I think my laser pointer died because I had to run it for a long um, Who's got a, got a laser pointer on the keychain? Exactly. Or on. Uh, oh, yeah. There you go. So this is tracing out Sector 67. Um, I think I'm being reprogrammed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, long story short, so this head is meant to work with a much smaller laser. And so we could take our big laser and turn it down to about 50 watts to not burn out the mirrors in here. Because I should just nuke the mirrors if you throw 500 watts at it. Because this is all liquid cooled, and this has no cooling, it's air cooled. So if you put a bunch of power into it, you're going to kill off the. Uh, um, oh, my God. Um, The, uh, so the mirrors are not um, water cooled, so we can't put very much power to it. There we go. Back to life. My makes uh, it touch. So yeah, you can kind of see that it's it's growing out. This would normally the software would normally control whether the lasers are on or not. And so in this case, you can see the rastering lines as it's moving between the pattern. But normally it would pick off the laser and kick on the laser and kick off the laser and kick on the laser as it's going out. Okay, um, here, show the people at home. Oh, yes, you can just blind them. That would be perfect. Okay, there you go. Can you guys see his hand? So, anyway, uh, this thing is like, uh, it's like $1,100 for this gel of it. And then this is like, $800 now. So the, the difference between them is this is a cutting head. So it's meant for handing lots of power and cutting through material. This is meant for scanning and engraving things really fast. So just like that piece I passed around, the perimeter of it would have been cut with something like this. And then it would have been moved to a separate machine, which has this Galvo head that would be doing that engraving on the surface of the market. Because the Galvo head can engrave really fast, and the laser head to grasp it back and forth, like our laser does, would take forever. And so you want really quick engraving and you want fast cutting. So there's two different things. You can use this head to cut, but at 50 watts, it's going to be relatively uh, slow, like way slow compared to 500. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. You can buy this machine with a, a 50 watt uh, head for like 1200 to $2,000 now, I think, running at, I should say, 20 to 50 watt of uh, power. So these, these lasers are becoming cheaper. The irony, though, is that a fiber laser cannot cut anything at the CO2 laser can, and a CO2 laser does a very bad job of cutting metal with these can cut. So, like, we could put a piece of paper in front of here with the fiber laser, of course, and it would take the ink off the paper, but it wouldn't touch the paper, which is kind of fun. Uh, the CO2 laser will nuke everything, uh, ink and paper and everything else. Um, so, could we make white dollar bills? You could make white dollar bills. In we fact, should try that for you the guys. It's a See, recording. <laughs> no. The uh, at the old at the old shop we had a, a hundred watt uh, Yay laser, which is a scroll power laser. So that can only fire pulses. It's used for welding, and that system uh, we were using to erase ink off of paper very readily. Now the deal with checks and stuff is that they have a background that also gets erased. So that's the way you can tell if it's like that. Been fraudulent. But paper, I think they. Bleach or something instead, of, or for uh, dollar bills and whatnot. There's that one that would be useful. Dollar bills are cheap. Ah, right there. Yes, they're, yeah, they're like cloth and water. Um, so, Chris, with the, the raster of the galvan laser, would you also have a gantry that would be back to the laser? So, that's, that's what this, so I didn't really talk about this controller. So, this controller is running the galvo head for us, which is actually really cool. One neat thing with this, I like plugged it together. And then like opened up the crazy software and got it installed and then pushed the button and it worked. It was like the easiest thing ever. 
But yeah, so what you can do is with a galvo is you can index it to locations and you can cut stuff and you can index it and cut stuff and index it and cut stuff. So they'll use these things sometimes for like loading and loading parts. So laser is expensive and still have a part to engrave here. It'll work here and then they'll shift it over here while this part's already loaded and fixtured. And then they'll engrave that one while the, you know, and work it back and forth. That way you don't have to have two laser systems you can double your throughput. So we don't have necessarily have a need for that. But if we only had a galvo head, we could put it on a cancer and move it around. Um, and this controller can accommodate that. So maybe does the galvo have a fixed focus? It does. It's 10 inches. Um, so at 10 inches. The that's the optimal, yeah, which is why I was focusing in my hand. You, it, on the ceiling, it'll draw, but it's it's back by that point. Other random questions? Did the software do the laser interaction or the fact that you're the lens? I believe has like eight elements in it, so I think that's unfolding. So what Brian's getting at is the Galvo is 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 aiming through this big fat lens, and then it's got a work area, and you need to de-skew that and fix it. And I'm not sure. I bet it's a combination of software and the, the optics doing as much as they can. Otherwise, your your uh, spot size will grow with the edges and your focal plane and all sorts of stuff does bad things. So you need to correct all those things to, to flatten it up. It has a, a 175 millimeter square work area, and then depending on the work area, it affects the spot size. Of course, so you get bigger and smaller ones. So with the with the auto uh, the cutting laser, can't you adjust the focus? Super slow, but it's way too slow. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, um, basically you could you could adjust the height, turn it into an autofocus, but you need to be able to monitor the spot size. So there's a set of split optics in there to, to reflect the reflection coming back up back into a camera to be able to camera into the footer. So it's yeah, it's, but it's got a 500 watch splitter, so it's yeah. allowing the beam to go through with that reflection. But back. isn't there like comparable? Off of the surface where it cuts at, and so you, as soon as you start, let's say you want to cut two inches of steel, but your optimal cutting head is eight inches above the material as you're diving into the, the, the head, doesn't move, it's the optics internally. So, the no, no, I, I guess I, my point is, couldn't you take that manual focus later turn into an autofocus thing that you just want to see my head of travel? Oh, yeah, you can. You can also adjust the internal focal height, the lens up and down as it's traveling, but it's way too slow. Oh, That's okay. why you need a piezo to slam that thing up and down. Crazy fast, like the thing's vibrating and it's running. If you look at the mechanism by which the laser is actually doing the cutting, I mean, they're all gas assist in the sense that you're blowing a gas through, and the plasma that it gets, that it creates at the surface, blowing through the lower material, is really how most materials cut. Uh, there's uh, differences like this. This laser here. You know, the, the visible light lasers, they're good for material plus than three eighths. If you want to cut thicker, they're better off with a steel two laser for various and sundry reasons. Um, that uh, something to do with the wavelength and you know how fast it's progressing. But the you know, the curve that it's cutting, you know, the, 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 the cut is falling behind the the laser. Kind of get an arc to it as it runs. Yeah. You'll see that on the science and stuff. Okay. So very briefly, I'm going to just talk a little bit about construction progress. So I've been working on uh, building posts and legs. So I don't know how many people were around when we built the original frame for the building. Uh, but the process to do that is you start with some kind of column stock and some kind of plate stock for the ends. And you stick them together and build a steel structure. And then you kind of work from that. So we were taking these, these were old concrete support posts from uh, Marshall Erdman Construction. They used to be up in Lanarkey. They closed like five, six years ago. We got a whole bunch of concrete form diagonal supports and which have been sitting in the back, uh, planning to use them for stock. So this is all three quarter inch plate we had sitting around or half inch plate that we had sitting around. And so uh, as it always goes, you should measure uh, how many times you cut, how many times? Okay. Believe it's, believe 14 it's or 15. The third, the third time's a charm. So. Anyway, I was trimming the columns to get them to the right length that I wanted. Um, so wait, you're calling these columns, I mean, they're made of metal, but they're called concrete columns? These, no, no, these used to be concrete form supports. So when you're pouring oh, a concrete wall and you have like a 30 foot tall, yeah, you gotta keep it from tipping over. So yeah, these were just like scrap material from that, that obviously a bunch of steel to us. That's yeah, four by four by three sixteenths. So four inch per two with three inch, three sixteenths inch wall. So here is kind of hard to see, but the, Point of it is that there's a red laser right here, going up and down, and then there's a green laser coming from the opposite side. 
this was needed to square the post on the, the foot so that I could weld the feet to the post vertically. So that later on we wouldn't have to correct it as badly when we we're grouting and setting it. Is that a super good? Uh, I checked the floor to start with. Thank you very much. Um, and so I tacked all the corners and then brought them over the wall there for weld them. What we're doing upstairs then is there's a beam line that we're like on below here, this big um, W1442 beam going across the ceiling. That beam can bear load on it in the middle or wherever we put it because it's it was built, we overbuilt all these columns in case we ever wanted to add another story above us. Uh, and so all of our footings, foundations, and, and supports are all designed to have additional load on top of them. So taking advantage of that, uh, we drill holes in the floor here above that beam line. And then um, I had to vacuum them out and pull them out with air and sweep them. And then in this case, this is an anchor rod, uh, which has to be of engineering strength. So it's not like buying threaded rod at the hardware store. You've got to buy a uh, uh, stated quality anchor rod. So these got all chopped up. And then you have to use an air gun to blow out the hole. And then you sweep it out with a brush a few times and you blow it out again. And then you sweep it out with a brush a few times and you blow it out again. And that's the follow. The process for what's called adhesive anchor. So it's literally like epoxy that you glue this rod into the concrete floor with. So that the floor will hold the rod and won't rip up. Uh, the reality is, if the roof goes away and the apartment is trying to lift up and fly away, we've got probably other issues. But conceptually speaking, this will hold it down uh, if you ever have uplift. A uh, house is a little more important because the uplift could be like a tornado trying to take your house away. Um, long time ago, they used to set the house on the foundation and everything would run out if they bothered to put a new roof in. I'm sure Sean can attest to that. <laughs> that whole house is two nails, maybe. Gravity work. Um, so these are uh, five posts set here. They're not squared yet. Uh, it's probably hard to tell, but they're all sitting all over the place. Um, but you're saying it's epoxy? It's a epoxy that holds the, the threads in. Yep. So oh, but just, then these are bolted these are to the threads. And then these are yeah. bolted down to the thread that's stuck in the floor. Yep. So it's like putting a, a rod on the floor, gluing it in the place, and then putting a nut on top. And then in this case, we end up lifting these up, throwing grout underneath it, like cement. Until it's left. And then plopping it back down and then bolting it down and twisting it around until it's straight. And you guys kind of had to do that with these. We right? had to do that with all these as well. Yep. And you can use the grout to pad up or down, depending on what the height is that you're shooting for. So that was to make all these things mostly flat to within about a quarter of an inch. We had a combination approach. So the grout actually, interestingly, we used a vibrator to liquefy the grout, and you could push the column down into the grout. And so we ended up, we tried using shims where they would push out. But it's, if you just held it where you wanted it and just touched it with a concrete vibrator, it would just shoot the grout out and it would level, which is pretty cool. Um, not recommended. It took three people, but it wasn't too bad. And then there's some goofy corner plates uh, to get the corners in the right spots. So then we got done doing all that. And again, my picture started to see there's a green line here. And the green line is an inch in the column here and an inch or right on the corner of the column here. So it turned out that our outside wall on the end wall on the west wall pivots in by an inch, which then in hindsight, we remember it. Oh yeah, that's right. That wall is weird when we were looking at the building originally. Uh, we got to fix that. So I had to, uh, again, measure twice, cut once, cut three times, measure six times. Uh, I cut the plate back off after I got a full welding it. So I put uh, eight inches times two plus four inches times two of weld into a half inch plate and then plopped all that back off again. Cleaned it up and then re welded it, got the column, moved the column in and bound by an inch because we didn't want to re drill the four anchors because you can't really move the anchors around once you put holes in the floor. And then we clamped and uh, plated and then extended the, the other angle iron that we had. Scott came by and helped to taper all the column tops so we could set the posts on top of it. And then we used the little pallet stacker that's up there to lift up all the steel in place um, after having kind of all of that stuff up. So slowly we got it together on three sides. Um, kind of the other relevant bit is in the middle of the building here where this beam is, you can bear along the beam. But at the outside wall, there's only two posts. And so Brian and I and, and uh, the engineers all worked on figuring out how to support the structure, this 20 by 24 foot space off of two posts on one side and five posts on the other side to get the loading so that it would go down to the beams and go to the floor or the ground down here, not bare on the concrete someplace. You can't point load the concrete or the concrete can fail. Uh, so we need to, to load on the steel, not on the concrete. 
So then we welded together the giant box tube, which is the reaction for the staircase um, that span across there. So then this is all the steel framework done. Uh, and then we got the joists uh, last. So then Sean and Jim and Tom and I uh, had some fun putting together these guys. So this was cutting, and Sean, of course, insists that we cut both ends of the joists because they, and I quote, look like they got cut with a chainsaw. Uh, so. I'm glad somebody's watching the like quality of work picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you can very clearly see lunchtime coming up here. Um, so uh, anyway, the joists went up very quickly. The system was reasonably -ish, square ish, squarer than we thought it was initially, except for one, one little area or off by like three quarters of an inch. Um, Fortunately, it doesn't really matter, it's cleaner. And so we have a, just a floor deck and the floor deck is built underneath the, the trusses upstairs. And so that'll kind of be buried in the wall. So it really doesn't matter too much. So anyway, we got that up and then uh, we got the decking put up uh, as well. As you can see, this takes really seconds to uh, assemble the whole thing. So we had glued, put down a construction adhesive, and then uh, Sean brought his fancy stand-up deck screw gun. So you can, it's got a really long uh, rod on to go screw all the screws in place. And this is just fine through low speed. Uh, wood is uh, down to only $32 a sheet, you know, for some crappy three-quarter inch OSP. So, which I don't, Sean, what would that have been three years ago? How long did that actually take for me to start? It was like a solid afternoon. I mean, we're back to the 2019 prices. Okay, so I was like, yeah, yeah. but I mean, that, that the, your whole deck assembly would have been twice as much. You know, it takes many months to cheap, cheap good. Yeah, so we paid 100 bucks for three quarters. Like, a year ago. So the joists were $100 a piece, so it's 24 of uh, them. And then the decking was like, like $1,200 for both levels. So. Uh, anyway, now that we've got the deck and the steel, so the steel there wasn't really anybody who could help besides Scott and I. Uh, so we're both certified welders, so we can do all the welding and all that stuff. And then uh, uh, Sean has all the expertise in building houses. So, but now we're past the wood part, so no more of that fast back to stuff. Steel so back to the steel stuff. Uh, so I got to set the tracks, and then we get to set um, we'll be able to box in the staircase by the car bay, and then build the outside walls. And Get it divided and stuff. So I've got a few more planning steps to demonstrate you done tomorrow. And if anybody's interested in learning how to frame walls or build stuff, is it going to be metal studs again? It's It'll like be all the evil metal studs again. We have them for free from when Urban closed, and they're 28 feet long. And so we can make them span the floor ceiling without having to stamp stuff together. As I joked with Sean, they don't make trees that tall anymore. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the trees that are there are less straight than the steel studs. Oh, gosh. <laughs> John uh, doesn't like that. I so. You could have good product, you'll probably have steel stuff. Well, I've left up plenty of steel to use up. Yeah, we got a lot of steel stuff. So, anyway, uh, yeah, so we'll do steel framing again. Uh, part of the reason for steel is because in the future, if the building use changes or code changes or who knows what, we're building out of what's considered an off level construction, except for the wood stuff, anywhere that wood is. But we have very little wood in the building, and that helps us uh, down the road if we want to do something different there, or build shifts or something crazy. So. Uh, at the time, too, the metal wasn't really that much more than it was considered. Questions? Well, I think that's all we got for presentations. Unless somebody has something they want to share as well. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, no, you did not miss a picture of the whole thing. It looked like finished. Oh, uh, there is a. Uh, <laughs> what's that? What are you moving in? What, oh, God. Uh, we got a few more steps to do. Right now, you can't buy a fire alarm control panel, which we need to get the sprinkler system finished. Uh, because you know, there's this whole like chip shortage thing. I don't know if anybody's heard about that, but you literally uh, a fire alarm control panel is seven hundred dollars is now two grand uh, because Honeywell apparently screwed up their supply line and they have no supply chain uh, for anything. So it's and even uh, just to have the apartment up there, you need that fire. We have protection. to have the whole building sprinkled, which oh. we have the building sprinkled, but we need a fire alarm control panel that. Um, that's part of what's has to work. So, yeah. Sprinkle, just not controlled. Sprinkle. Well, no, it'll, the sprinkler <laughs> system will Sprinkle do its thing. Goes off the water. Yeah, it just won't call anybody. But you know, it's fine with me, but it's 
There's a lot of states actually that's totally okay. So if you have an automatic sprinkler system, they don't care if it calls anybody when it goes off because it's just putting your own building. Um, we have lots of ways of sensing it, but Wisconsin code requires it to be remotely monitored. So we have to pay for monitoring, uh, which is actually pretty cheap now, but it's got to have a dial-up system, so it'll call out. You can, you can finally use the internet though. It's uh, Welcome to 2021. You can use the internet now to connect data to places. It's an astounding well, okay, place. I'm but kind of joking, but I mean, does it actually say it has to be a certified, you know, money well? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's got to be all listed and everything else. So, yep. And it passes additional tests for national fire protection listing and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's. They're a little picky about it. You could definitely fake one. I mean, after watching Kate's presentation, I'm, I'm thinking maybe just you know, like, turn off the report. Copy and hide. Copy and hide. That's it. We just shove copy and hide the controller and it'll look all. So, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so we're getting there. Like I said, the plans are all approved. It's a matter of now building all the elements of it to figure that out. So, we have the steel for the staircase. We're waiting on the side plates for the steel for the staircases so we can get those. Uh, install and bent up. We're gonna go front off and bend them yet. So slowly but surely, but surely slowly. Fantastic. Yeah, getting there. All right, I'm gonna kill off the Zoom for all the Zoom people. Hold on, I'll give up the chat messages. Oh, dancing, go for it. So I've got a focus stacking thing I've been working on a little bit. Let's see if it shares properly. Um, showing the presentation. Okay, so uh, I've been messing around with uh, sticking a cell phone on a microscope on a 3D printed mount to do focus stacking for microscope. Uh, so uh, let's see if we'll do the slides properly. Okay. So pretty much uh, I focus on the top of the subject and take a picture and then move it down through the focus range, taking a picture each time. And I found some software that will take the high contrast regions and combine that into a single good picture. So uh, the problem with cheap microscopes is that they have really mediocre depth of field. And that's kind of just a property of the optics, but using cameras, you can get a better picture. So here's the setup. Uh, I have a little 3D printed mount that I just used to get the right spacing on it so I don't have to hold the phone exactly right. Uh, I didn't like have an XY thing on it, so I just kind of hold it in place at this point, but this could be improved to have it like actually line up the grammar correctly. Uh, the software also fixes the alignment, so I'm not super concerned with that right now. Uh, and the software I'm using is combined ZP. It's free. It's kind of old, but it seems to still work. Uh, so here's an example of a focus stacked image. Uh, the subject is a cashew. I took 21 pictures of it. And uh, it's like, we're kind of looking at the wall of, it's like a cliff essentially. So normally you wouldn't be able to focus on nearly as much at once. Here's a picture that's just like, what is in focus for one picture. And there's like kind of a tiny section there versus like significant depth. And then uh, off to the right is a depth map that just kind of shows like which sections of the output image were from which other pictures. So green is closer to the top, blue is closer to the bottom. Uh, you can see it didn't do a great job of getting the stuff combined. And then like outside of the circular zone in the microscope, there's just like a whole bunch of clutter because it doesn't really know what's happening. Uh, I tried another thing with a resistor. This one actually worked pretty well. Uh, in the individual images, I could focus on either the wire coming out of the resistor or the top of the resistor. Uh, but combining a bunch of pictures together, you have like the green area, which is the top pictures, and then the blue areas from the pictures later on. So it's great for taking a picture of something that's not like a very flat thing. If you want three dimensional solid objects, uh, you get a light point at the top of it and then use focus stacking so you can see the entire thing. And then I tried it with a dead bug that I found because that was another interesting subject. Uh, 40 on 100 times works pretty well. Uh, 400 times has a very small focus range. and I didn't want to stack a huge number of photos to get the entire thing. So I got pretty much the eye of the insect. Um, it does take a while to process the pictures. So 
doing the alignment and stacking a whole lot of them is kind of a pain. So you want to try and like limit it to maybe 10 fixtures. You could do a lot more, it would just take a while. That's pretty much what I had. Does anyone have questions about this? Oh, that's just like the reticle thing that's inside the microscope. So that's present on all of the things because that's like something that was built into the optics. It's for like uh, schools. So if you're trying to like point something out, you can point the pointer at it. Um, does it support uh, grabbing frames from a video? Like, could you just zip? It does. Uh, I didn't do that because it would have been lower resolution, but that's like a better way to get focus through all the frames. I'm not okay. sure if it would be faster because lower resolution, but also a lot more frames. Uh, that's an option option in the software. I haven't really played with it yet. Yeah, I wonder if there is an hack to use like a, you know, Google's got the Pixel phones that have their own image processor in them. And I wonder if there isn't a way to leverage the computational processing that's built into Harbor on those. Uh, you, you could probably make an app or something that would do this pretty well. Yeah, uh, just a thought. That'd be cool. Lots more work. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, anybody? Anybody looked through a microscope in the last decade? Okay. I'm just, just uh, well, no, I'm just a survey of the crowd here. So you got two yeses and a field of no's. But the reason being is uh, if you haven't, you don't realize how limited your field is. If it really is, it's like a slice. It works great for like microscope slides where you're putting down like a slide slip on top of it and everything gets squished down to being perfectly flat. But if you're trying to look at like an actual object that has depth, it's kind of a pain. What if you're trying to look at like something suspended in water? Like if uh, you're trying to look at little, little water craters that are at different depths than, you know, like say a, a millimeter of water. If they're alive, it would probably not work super well because they'd move between the frames. Uh, if it, if they're completely stationary, I think this would work for that as well. I, I sense an application where we use our laser autofocus piezo lens system <laughs> plus a video, and you could you could hammer. And on, if so. you got like a high speed camera or something, and you can take enough frames really fast, you could yeah. like get it pretty well without them moving too much. But. It's, too bad Todd's not here, but Todd works on microscopy. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Oh, oh, he's going to be too late for the fellow oh, to catch it on YouTube. You were talking about your own. Yeah. Uh, it's, this is like stuff that he does. So, because the other trick they do with uh, tumor cells, I know, is they take micro slices of the cells and then they take pictures of it and then they can do 3D surfaces that way. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole, you know, I, I'm assuming Jansen knows about this too, like confocal microscopy is the same concept. But with using fluorescence, but also on a microscope. Uh, but it's extraordinarily expensive when you buy it through, you know, Zeiss and whatever. Um, but yeah, Z stacks, I mean, the exact same concept, but with all proprietary software. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and those have the, the, you know, the focus knob is built in, it's all computerized so that it's taking each of its pictures at a set, you know, the focus knob. Yeah, but I mean the exact same thing, but it's, it looks really cool seeing the same concept on things as big as an insect, you know, instead of within a single cell. And that's what I was saying. Some of the new image processors that are present in the phones that we have, like our phones can take, which I'm sure you guys know, astronomically, spectacular pictures compared to what would have been present and possible you know, even a, a couple of years ago with the given the light especially with the optics how tiny how tiny how terrible the optics are on the phone um so that's i think like connecting this with some of that processing would be crazy powerful the problem is there's a whole team of people working on the processing so imagine give it another 10 years and this will be like you know yeah it zips you zip down the thing it took a video and now it's like a beautiful 3d uh bug you know wrapped in color and everything I guess if you wanted to like put a uh, or some sort of measurement on the focus adjustment, like the the depth of field is small enough, you could kind of generate a three D model based on like what parts of it were in focus as you're moving the focus along. Yeah, 
Well, that's what I was going to say is with your depth map alone, we could use uh, on the CNC router, it's pretty common to take a grayscale image and then turn it into a 3D surface. And yeah. so you could use a grayscale image and then route it uh, into a piece of wood or something. It'd be kind of cool. Let's see that bug eye. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, oh, I'm looking at the bug eye thinking that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Any other? So the, the stereo or the the alignment feature of this is also neat because it works for making uh, like 3D stereo photos of stuff without using like a complicated tripod setup. So I just like take a picture of a building, step 10 feet to the right, take another picture and then align it properly and then like send it to myself and then like sort of cross-eyed look at my phone and get a 3D image through that. Nice. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool, it was weird because, you know, five, six years ago, a 3D cameras and 3D, everything was the hot ticket and it totally vaporized and uh, there's still a lot of cool opportunities there, but the commercial side of it got kind of overplayed. We, we do have some, I have some microscopes that have uh, encoders on. So if you did ever want to track your X, Y, or Z location uh, thing, I've got some microscopes that are instrumented that way. Um, I'd be interested in taking a look at those at some point. Yeah, I've got an optical comparator upstairs too, which I don't know how much that would help you, but. Uh, a what? Uh, it's an optical comparator. It's usually used for uh, uh, inspection, like uh, machining inspection. And then we've got an edge edge microscope as well. It's used for looking at the edges of things for, again, for inspection. I don't know, if you can take a look at, we've got mm -hmm. a bunch of oddball microscope stuff, so. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else have anything or? All right, I'm going to kill off the recording here. Uh, it's good to see everybody. See you all soon.